I'm Peter from the Daily Rios. And I'm Eric from the Longbox Review. And this is Peter and Eric's Legion Project Podcast. Welcome to the second episode of the Legion Project Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Eric, and with me is Peter. Hello, Peter. Hey, Eric. How are you? Good. And how are you? I'm good. You know, I wanted to ask you, are you affected by any of those wildfires going on? Oh, my gosh. Actually, I was going to bring this up. Actually, yeah. (laughs) Oh, no. And and I totally don't mean that as a pun. I just realized what I said. Oh, yeah, yeah. (laughs) I don't mean that as a pun at all. I'm legit concerned. Is it smoky? Is it near you? What's it, going? Yeah, it is. It is horribly smoky here. So, and and we're you know I, I, we actually have a a fire in, that's about fifteen twenty minutes away from my location. Uh, it's it's a small fire. Uh, I think they were they had it pretty well contained as of uh, this morning, um, but we are surrounded my location we're surrounded by by fires you know all the way i think i think in california all up through washington oregon canada montana so yeah it's it's pretty smoky and i found out this morning so this is the this is the uh, wednesday before rose city comic con in portland oregon and uh my wife heard uh, some people at work talking about how the main freeway that we travel to go to Portland, portions of it are closed. Wow. So we have to come up, well, basically we have to go to Seattle and then down south to go to Portland. Um, uh, we're, we're taking off tomorrow afternoon to do that. So I'm, I'm a little concerned about our travel arrangements getting to uh, Rose City Comic Con. Mm. Wow, that's crazy. There's a lot of that. Uh, just, just craziness all over the country with the wildfires, the hurricanes. Exactly. It's yeah. yeah. I hope right. everybody's staying safe. That's for sure. Yeah. We don't have a poly. What is that? What is that screen around the Earth in uh, the future? Oh, the, pol- the polymer screen. Is that? Yeah. Right? Is that right? <laughs> I guess we'll be talking about that. In yeah. <laughs> uh, for those people who don't know, Eric is out in the West, and I'm I'm on the East. So, um, you know, we're dealing with two different things going on, I guess. So, uh, we're back. We're back for episode two, right? Yeah. After the, the, uh, the excitement of episode one, excitement and chaos, <laughs> <laughs> the teases and, and all the, the, uh, yeah, that was so much fun doing that. So, uh, I just want to say, I want people to know Peter, Peter's the one that came up with those, those, those cool graphics. And uh, I was the happy recipient of being being able to retweet those out. <laughs> I like to be silly. I have time, right? I have time. I have nothing but time. <laughs> <laughs> right now. Right now. Yeah. Things might get a little busier as we go. Yeah. Um, so along with those teases. So we have a couple of things that we want to talk about up front before we dig into the issue. And um, um this should this little preamble shouldn't be as long as as what we did for episode one, but who knows? Um, so I wanted to quick talk about the origin of the name Legion Project, and I just found an email and I sent forwarded it to uh, to Eric um, from August twenty eighth, twenty thirteen, almost four years to the dot that we released that first episode, right? Yeah, that was a weird coincidence. Yeah. So at that time, it was just a generic email uh, saying, hey, Eric, um, uh, if we if we ever if I ever catch up on my Legion reading, I'd love to do a Legion podcast with you. Now, of course, we didn't have any name or anything like that, but that was like the inkling. That was the first that was like the seed. So when it came time to batting around names, we both offered up ideas and then the name 
the Legion project was hit um, as a reference to a later storyline within the Baxter run called the Universo Project. Uh, it was a four-issue story arc uh, that closed out the third year of the Baxter run. And there was just something about that that I liked. Uh, as I looked around the net, it, it wasn't taken just yet. Um, there was a, there were a lot of podcasts focusing on the Legion TV show, which we you know joked about last episode. Um, and I, I was like hem, hemming and hawing. We call it the Legion of Superheroes Project. And I was like, no, the Legion Project. We'll just call it the Legion Project. People will know what it is. And the name stuck. Now, that was a pretty good choice. And by all means, if there is another podcast that has that name, let us know. <laughs> but, no, 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 uh, no, no. Peter, we, we were first. We were first. Okay. Just, it's we'll, ours. we'll just go with that. <laughs> <laughs> um. And then the second thing we want to talk about is the new intro theme song that you just heard uh, um, as we uh, edit this episode together, <laughs> just to pull the curtain a little bit. Um, um, and the theme songs, so we went on a hunt. Um, Eric clued me in that there's a whole bunch of music on YouTube that's called free music or royalty free or copyright free. Um, and I knew there was, there was some of that, but I didn't know to the extent until you had mentioned it. And we batted around a number of choices and we came up with, um, the, the one that you heard. And it's by a composer that goes by the name of Ro, R H O. And we will put links in the show notes to not only his YouTube, the person's YouTube page and, and the person's Twitter account. Um, but we thought it was a good fit for something that sounded heroic and maybe a little bit um, epic and uh, a little bit uh, super heroic or futuristic even to some degree. What do you, what do you think? Yeah, that's I, obviously it was the best choice. Cause that's when we, the one we went with, cause we, I think I offered like three or four options and you had, you had four or five and, and then you found this one. And uh, yeah, I think has a, a great, uh, a great sound to it, and and it gives you that kind of uplifting, hopeful uh, sense. I think. Yeah. Which is kind of how I think of the Legion. The the Legion theme song to the cartoon show is just a little too, um, guitar-y, a little too I don't know electric. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're not talking about the cartoon show. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this, this, this theme song is grand and, and uh, I like it. So we're going to go with it. So That's thank right. you, Ro, R-H-O. Yes. Thank you. It's, it's so nice that people offer things that creative endeavors like that for free. Yeah. Much like this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of our podcast, uh, just a reminder that the episodes are being dropped on both of our feeds. So you can subscribe to the long box review or you can subscribe to uh, the daily Rios. Um, that way, <clears throat> if you're not a listener of my show, you can just get it from Eric's feed and vice versa. So uh, it just seemed to be the easiest thing right now. Who knows? Maybe down the road we're like, all right, we'll, we'll get a separate feed. But for now, I kind of like it this way. Mm. You can listen. You, they can listen at their own pace. Um, um, it, it also allows us to have an episode in the can when when we don't want to put out one of our own. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> well, that that will benefit me greatly, Peter. But for you, you you have so many. I don't know how many you're doing. About what three a week averaging nowadays? Yeah, I try, maybe I, more. I had a week that had about five, and then I was yeah. You know, some weeks just roll up, and I'm like, nah, I can't do it. Ah. So. Um, and it was like this week, I wanted the Legion one to be out for like a day or two before I released another one. Um, yeah, you know, the, this, this is nice. It, it, it fills one of the days in case I ever get the urge to do five. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to, uh, dovetail on what Peter said about, uh, listening in on, on our respective feeds. Um, this is a great opportunity for people who, uh, who subscribe to my feed to uh, go and subscribe and listen to, to Peter's show because we have we have such different kinds of shows. Peter talks s comics on his, but it's not just that. And and if you're looking for you know just comic book 
stuff from from my point of view, then then you can you can listen to my feed for those people that subscribe to Peter's podcast. Right. Right. It's, it's a nice, it's a nice, uh, I think a nice synergy between our two shows in that respect. Yeah. That might be a good segue to jump into some feedback that we got. Yes. I love feedback. Yeah. And, and it's all pretty, it's all pretty good. You know, they, it's, it's early feedback yet. Nobody's really talking about the issues. Um, and we are recording quite quickly after we released the first episode, but, um, uh, just a reminder that you don't have to wait until an episode drops to talk about a future issue. If you if you're reading ahead and you already have thoughts about issue three, issue four, issue five, send it to us. Send it to us. We'll keep it in the file and um, and then we'll, we'll we'll use it on the episode. Um, so I got something from Eric who lives here in Philadelphia and he just posted yes. One of my three favorite series runs of all time. So that's awesome. Did they mention what the uh, his other favorites were? No, that was that was it. Okay, but it, but it sounds like he's of my our generation. You know, my generation, our generation. So um, it, it goes to show how much. Oh, I mean, we got another one too. Who's the? Um, I got something from Charlton Hero, who runs the Superhero Satellite Blog. And he kind of suggests the same thing, that he's been a Legion fan since childhood, and this this is one of those runs that he remembers fondly, and uh, he wants us to know that he will be reading along with us as we put out the episodes. Excellent. Yeah. And I, I was just contacted today, Peter, uh, 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 Damien, who's appeared on my show a few times, uh, he let me know that he went and bought the uh, the issues digitally and, and indicated that he would be reading along. So that's great. That's that's awesome that people are are picking this stuff up and and uh, re reading it or rereading it as the case may be. And I hope to hear from these guys. Yeah, apparently. So the the first six issues are on Comixology um, for a dollar ninety nine each, and then the next stretch of issues after that you can get as a digital trade on Comixology. But that's all that they have for this particular run. Oh, well, that's disappointing. Yeah. So, DC, get on a trade <laughs> program here. It, it, yeah, I, I'm really surprised that they don't have more of, of that of that run, huh? I I'm wonder what to... the what the rest of the the sorry. Uh, I wonder what the rest of the uh, the the volumes, uh, the collection of digital issues that are available out there. I haven't looked at that. <laughs> Yeah, and I know they have a bunch of Legion stuff from the newer Legion runs, the New 52, prior to, to the New 52, the Mark Wade Superboy, uh, um, Mark Wade reboot, um, some other collections here and there. Uh, but this Baxter run, no, they, they've never fully traded this Baxter run. And mm -hmm. I, was tr I was trying to think, have I found, do I remember seeing the issues in back issue bins when I used to go to conventions a lot. And I, and I did, I do remember seeing some back issues of this, but because I never needed to collect it, I really wasn't looking. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I don't know if you could like go online and go to eBay and find all 63 issues plus annuals for, I don't know, $30 or whatever. Hmm. I'm going to have to keep that, uh, keep that in mind when I'm at Rose city, I want to see what, uh, what uh, legion availability there is in the back issues from the vendors there. Yeah. A couple more feedback, electric mayhem on Twitter. Uh, he, his name is Matt. He said he loved the first episode full of detail and your passion for the material is flying high. And then Daryl Taylor of the Taylor network of podcasts says I'm digging the discussion. And he's, he also said that he wants to try to find the issue so that he can read along. That is high praise from those guys. That, thank you. That, that's really cool. Yeah, I mean that they take the time to listen to our little vanity project here. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and anybody who gave us a retweet, a like, or who sent uh, you know any kind of feedback, um, um, thank you. Just really appreciate it. And uh, I hope that we can keep the discussion going and that we keep your interest. For sure. 
So I think uh, what we'll do at the top of uh, or near the beginning of each episode is um, if we have anything sort of left over from the previous issue, this will be a good time to kind of just, you know, bat around, hey, you know what, I had another thought about this or something came up. And um, Eric, you have one and then I have one. So do you want to go first? Sure. And mine's kind of a cheat because it doesn't actually have anything to do with the story in that first issue. But uh, much like, I don't know, Peter, um, I don't know if you did this, but uh, I used to record television shows on videotape, mm-hmm. you know, including including uh, the the, uh, the commercials. Mm-hmm. And as years went on and I would, you know, I'd pop in my uh, one of the video cassettes of Star Trek The Next Generation that I had recorded um, I, I would, you know, I'd run across these old commercials that are, you know, five or 10 years old or whatever. And I always find those kind of, uh, you know, a um, bit of uh, oddity, I guess, or, or, um, you know, interesting bits of, of trivia from, from yesteryear. Mm-hmm. And, and so in that vein, I, when I was reading issue one again, in preparation for our talk, I came across this double page uh, ad for, uh, for DC. It's a house ad, uh, get them at your comic store or subscribe today. And it's, uh, it's got a cover or a picture of, of issue one of Legion of superheroes, along with interestingly enough, uh, warlord issue 84. And then, uh, on the other side is this, this, uh, order form, which they got the, you know, the, 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 uh, dash line around to, Theoretically, you could cut it out, I guess, of your comic. <laughs> Which did you did you ever do that, Peter? Did you ever cut a page or something out of a comic to send in to somebody? Oh, absolutely! In fact, did you really? Um, yeah, the um, um, so the Baxter run flip flops back and forth with the uh, n- newsstand version called Tales of the Legion of Superheroes, right? And at this point in 1984, they're still telling new stories. Well, the first issue of the Tales of the Legion of Superheroes title um, that w- that came out right around this time, which would be issue number uh, 314, um, that had the same cover date as issue one of the Baxter run. That's where I clipped out the little subscriber coupon for the Legion Baxter. I actually got... Um, I started the Legion Baxter run with issue 15. Hmm. And it was because when I sent in the coupon, um, I guess it just took that long to, to for them to send their first issue. You know, and I'm pretty sure by the time I saw the coupon or clipped it or begged my mom to pay the, I don't know, what was the price? What are the prices here? Like three bucks, five bucks, whatever. Um, six no i guess like 10 yeah um by the time i we, we had sent it in a, a bunch of those first baxter issues had come out already so by the time i my subscription started it was around issue 15 and so yes to to answer your question yes i've asked and i have it here and it still has the clipped out section oh my gosh <laughs> i've never done that yep and and what's funny about that is you know they 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 give you this opportunity to clip this out, I guess. And then you turn the page and it's actually a page of, you know, from the issue of the comic. So if you clip that out, you would pretty much lose uh, page 14 of the comic. But anyway, <laughs> it's poor planning on their part. I don't know. Um, but really what I wanted to talk about was, was uh, I saw this, 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 this uh, um, subscription ad and I was counting the comics, looking at all the comics that they had available including the Legion of Superheroes, the Baxter. And uh, I thought it was curious, Peter, because of 10 out of 32 titles that they list here are non-superhero related. Mm-hmm. Well, for the most part. Uh, there's my, there's a little, little bit of overlap there with New Talent Showcase, perhaps. But um yeah, there there were ten, you know, roughly a third of the comics that they offer here, and I don't know if this is the was this the this can't be the entire run of DC Comics at that time, can it? Oh sure, yeah sure, mm-hmm. really, yeah. thirty two. Yep. Wow. So yeah, I just thought that was really cool that that back then, back in, this is what eighty four, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, eighty four, that they had 
like I said, roughly a third of their line was non-superhero comics. And you don't have that today. No, and, that, and that's something that, you know, happened because of the crisis, on the flip side of the crisis, you lost a lot of that. Those oh, that's different- true genre books you know there was no warlord gi combat sergeant rock jonah hex Arik, arion lord of atlantis i mean all those were non-existent Mm -hmm. um they were maybe present within the dc continuity or dc dc uh uh, you know little appearances here and there but as a title they were gone um no that that's exactly right i mean dc was on was not um prior to crisis Prior to the height of New Teen Titans, it it really wasn't uh, they 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 uh, they weren't <laughs> selling a lot of books, I guess, and um, um, you can sort of see it because they they were paring down their their line, and as they were gearing up for 1985, 1986, suddenly you know that's when they would get success after success, and they could they could um, branch out a little bit more. I would love to count how many titles they had uh, how many titles they were producing around like 1987 1988 yeah. um you know but yeah this is it this is this is this is all she wrote at that time hmm. what was your thing so my thing is um i sent you images of original artwork oh, that right. you can find online and uh i'll link them in the show notes so you, so you can see one of them is a page. They're both from issue one. Um, uh, page around page fifteen or so, where Light Lass is fighting Radiation Roy, and we commented how how the use of shadows in that scene were, was very striking. And now you could see the original artwork, and you can see just the heavy blacks and how they um, how the inker Larry Mouch did. Um, you could almost see how he painted. Um, these, these, these black areas to make them really, really, really dark. Uh, so that's the one. And then the second original artwork is from the, one of the random pages later in the book that features that detective that is looking for Light Lass. Um, he, I guess he was hired by Timberwolf, Bryn Londo. And again, it's kind of like, uh, it's almost very noir y because it's him in his office smoking a cigarette and uh, a lot of smoke and a lot of um, his features are usually always covered in shadows. And it's just another, another bit of original art that is, uh, I think one of these is actually on auction right now and it's only up to about 160 bucks. Um, wow. and, I think, and I think the other one, the light last one might be up to like 500 or something. Oh, like. see, I, that's the one I was interested in. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little pricey for me. Yeah. <laughs> So I sent you the images. I'll I'll send you the links. And as I said, I'll put the links in the show notes so people can see it. And uh, I'll put it side by side with the final image. So um, because I think it's great that, first of all, that it exists. Original artwork actually exists from this issue. And uh, it's cool to see the before, uh, before they get the coloring and all that other stuff on it. Yeah, yeah. Especially like the, I think those particular, those two pages in particular, um, Given given how much shadow plays into or you know shading, um, the, the use of that technique, uh, it's it's interesting to me that both of those pages you found and and those are I think in my mind they're too prominent, be, uh, they're they're prominent because of that the the, the use of shadow and, and shading and and whatnot. So uh, yeah, I that, those are one of the, the the two more interesting pages in in that issue. And here's the original pages. Man, I wish. I wish we could, uh, maybe we should go in halvesies, Peter. <laughs> you can have it for half the year and I'll have it for the other half. <laughs> there you go. I mean, with this, uh, this volume is all about the paper of it, right? The Baxter paper. So I think talking about the ad, talking about the original art, um, it kind of makes sense because it's, that was the whole point of this, of this paper stock was to make uh, you know, when Wolfman and Perez said, hey, we're tired of Perez's art being butchered in the printing process. What can we do? Can we can we use the paper stock from Camelot 3000 and actually make this stuff stand out? So um, I think uh, 
paying attention to that or coming across some original artwork is is important to talk about. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you found those. All right. Um, you think that's enough preamble? Shall we go into issue two itself? Let's do it. All right. Well, the first thing I want to do is, because I think we neglected to do it last episode, is to read the full credits list. Oh, right. <laughs> Oops. Oops, bad podcasters. Bad podcasters. I know, right? Um, so we have Paul Levitz and Keith Giffen. They're, they're listed as writer, plotters, pencilers. Obviously, Paul Levitz is the writer, Keith Giffen is the penciler, and they're both listed as plotters. Larry Malstead is the inker, John Costanza is the letterer, uh, Carl Gafford is the colorist, and Karen Berger is the editor. And um, sometimes the cover color is done by Anthony Tallinn. Um, I know on the first issue he, he did the color for the cover. Um, I'm not certain about this one, but uh, um, I just wanted to give make sure we said the credit um, the, the credit list as we talk about, uh, as yeah. we talk about the book. Yeah. I, I, I know we, we talked about some of them last time, but I don't think we listed everybody. So yeah, good. I'm glad you, glad you remembered that. Uh, I'll, I'll do my 40 lashes later. <laughs> Shall I, uh, read the description for this issue and then we can go into it. Great. Okay. So this is short and sweet compared to the, the first one, uh, as I recall, but, uh, the newly formed Legion of supervillains, puts its sinister plan into motion to kill each and every Legionnaire and take over the universe. Dun, dun, dun. I don't know, Peter, what, what do you think of the, I read that description and uh, the, the last part, take over the universe. You know, there, there something's going on uh, in this issue, um, but what exactly they're doing is not clear to me after reading it, you know, just looking at what's on the page there. Uh, you know, they're, they're doing something big beyond just trying to kill the Legion, which was, was made very apparent in the last issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, what it is they're trying to accomplish isn't quite clear yet. And so I always find it interesting whenever you get these, these real brief descriptions like this, mm-hmm. um, where they almost reveal too much. <laughs> or, you know, maybe it's a red herring for, for that matter, but it's just, I always find that interesting. Well, we'll come back to that. Let's, let's put a pin in that and uh, okay. we'll come back to the plan. Uh, Cause I, I, I liked, <laughs> I liked that plan. Um, um, do you want to, let's just give like a generic uh, overview of, um, of the issue itself. Um, basically, mm-hmm. you know, answer the question, what did you think of this issue? <laughs> okay. Um, do you want me to go first? Do you want, do you want to go first or how you, you go ahead? Okay. So I wrote a whole bunch of notes about my thoughts after reading this. And again, just for listeners so that they are aware, I'm not reading ahead. I'm really only reading this issue. And there are some things that I remember and there are a lot of things that I don't remember. And what I find interesting about that is it almost feels like I'm reading this issue as if it came out for the first time um, because I'm not reading ahead. So I'm not – like I didn't read issue three before we recorded episode two. So it's not like I can filter what happens later into our discussion now. So what I like about that is some of the things that I talked about in episode one are wrong. Some of the speculations are, are off the mark. And I kind of like that because it kind of makes it feel a little current. And I think it also allows for, um, it allows for our, the, our thoughts to be, uh, organic, you know? So, um, are you doing the same thing? Are you reading issue or, or are you cheating and reading ahead? <laughs> nope. I, I am, I'm doing exactly the same thing and for the same reason that you stated. So yeah, I really like this idea of us, uh, discovering or, you know, rediscovering in, in some fashion, but discovering what this is from our points of view, especially, you know, now 30 some years later. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's, 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 it's a lot of fun. And I, I, you know, I joked with you at some point when we were discussing uh, uh, getting this started about how it was going to be really hard for me 
not to just dive in and read the entire storyline and then, and then go back and take notes on it. Mm -hmm. But as I, as I did that first issue, I realized, no, this, I want to, I want to discover this with Peter and, and talk about it and not, you know, not have that knowledge that you, that, you know, like you, like you talked about. So this is, this, this is, this aspect of it is really what's making me excited about talking uh, with you about this, this comic. Yeah. So having said that, um, the, the whole question of like, did you like this issue? Did you not like this issue is, is probably going to be a futile effort. Um, (laughs) because it's very clear that I love this series. Um, what, what I came away with, with this second issue, it almost felt, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but it almost felt like when I was done, I said, was there another issue in between issue one and two? Be- and the reason I say that is because I felt the story and the tone of the book, I felt that it all really ramped up from what we got from the first issue, both, both in terms of, well, both in terms of how many characters are in this issue compared to the first issue on both sides of the teams, how many locations we, we get. I thought the artwork opened up. Um, not in, in the detail sense, but it's not as heavy. It's not as shadowy. It's not as inked, you know, those big black ink sections that we talked about in the original art, um, except for a few pages, they're not as noticeable in this issue. So the tone, whereas the first issue had, had this real ominous nature, um, in terms of building up the Legion of Supervillains in the background. You know, you open up with Lightning Lord and this castle and it's raining and they're talking about blood feuds and blood curses or whatever. Um, and this one, as you alluded to, they're kind of all out in the open with their plan. And, and we're seeing that, um, while it is based on vengeance, that was something that the narration was really big on in the first issue, you know, this idea of vengeance, um, they're organized. They are really organized and they are putting the Legion on this massive defensive nature that I don't think the Legion is, is really used to. So not only has I, has this issue like kind of blew up for me, I thought the urgency kind of increased. Um, it, it just felt bigger. Right. And, and, the characters have tripled on both sides, which is crazy. And it makes me think, what's the next issue going to be? And the one after that, is it just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger? And obviously there are some images that are still in my brain from later issues that I'm like, yeah, that, you know, that's what's going to happen. Um, so in that regard, what do you, what do you think about that? Or what were your own thoughts? Does that make you think of anything? Did you, did you have that same notion? Actually, I kind of had a somewhat opposite reaction to <laughs> to okay. this issue. Um, it, it, no, it's it's curious though that you what you said about how you, you, it kind of felt like you know what, did I, did I miss an issue? Um, and for me, I I got sort of the same sense. Only it was like it, it seemed like we're missing some elements here, but the Legion themselves, and this is one of the things I wrote down specifically was they don't seem to be as affected by what's going on as I think they should be. Mm. And, and considering what you just said, the way you described it, it seems like even more to me that they should be, that they should be taking this a lot more seriously, uh, that they should be uh, making plans, you know, uh, not just attacking things uh, in, or uh, sorry, reacting to things, not even attacking things, you're just reacting Right. To situations. Right. So it just it seems like a very I don't know, it, it maybe it speaks to the uh, to a, a particular vulnerability of the Legion itself in the way that they are processing and, like I say, reacting to what the, the LSV are doing. So I, I just thought it was a weird, a weird sense of uh, not caring <laughs> enough <laughs> about what's going on in this issue. But it, you know, from from a thematic point of view and and from a from a plotting point of view, it may you know it's it, it works out very well. It's just it's just a, to me, it's an odd way for for characters to respond to such a, uh, uh, a dangerous, potentially dangerous situation. Yeah, I totally agree with that because you know the the writers 
Um, while there are moments of, of threats and threatening danger and action and confrontation, there's still this lightheartedness to it. Um, you know, like the scene with Wildfire and Dawnstar, like Wildfire just kind of makes jokes, but yet something bad happens to him. And the same thing with Dawnstar. Um, the element lad, um, waiting in the Legion headquarters because he's the leader at this point and, and he's like giving us a status quo of where all the Legion is. He's being very organized and very tactical, you know, um, and, and almost to the point of, Shouldn't he be a little more worried? I mean, I know he is. And I, I, you're right. I think it is the point. I think this whole thing is the point that the Legion of Superheroes, I mean, supervillains, have found a weakness in the Legion, um, and they're exploiting it. And, you know, because I know what happens, in the, you know, in the last issue, uh, you I wonder if this is purposeful, like keeping things light because they know they're going to hit us with something really deep later on. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that totally makes sense. When I say that I feel like uh, there was an issue missing, I don't mean because of information. I just was kind of taken back that um, we just – we. Even though the book opens with the same thing that it opened with in issue one, with the scene with Lightning Lord, um, we're like in it. We're we're in it. The Legion of Supervillains, you know, we get a battle between Lazon and uh, – is that his name? Yeah, Lazon, Titania, mm-hmm. and Magno, uh, Lad, and Wildstar, Wildfire, and Dawnstar, and – and then you get uh, a little roundup of the Legion and whoever's on Earth in the headquarters. We see where Starboy and Dream Girl and Shrinking Violet are coming from. And then, like, halfway through the book, you're like, oh, by the way, here's most of the Legion of Supervillains that you're going to see. And I was like, whoa, that reveal was like, oh, well, they're just giving us a scorecard right away, aren't they? They're, they're mm. sort, of, sort of saying, okay, here they are, and now – and the next thing we're going to do something big and then we're going to do something bigger. And then we're going to show you, uh, we're going to give you, we're going to hit you in the gut for the ending reveal. And it's like, Oh my God, the breakneck speed of this issue. I thought the first issue we talked about how like, you know, nobody was in costume. Nobody was calling anybody by their superhero names. Not, not to the big, a big degree. And it felt like these small little vignettes. And to your point, what you said, um, that's what the Legion of Superheroes, they're big. The team is about like 23 members by now or something like that. And they're spread out all without the universe. So if somebody's gunning for them, um, they're going to take advantage of that. And I thought this issue uh, played with that notion really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You gotta, we got to give uh, credit to, to Paul Levitz and, and uh, Keith Giffen for – for the way that they're telling the story, the way that they're building this up, as you, as you, as you talked about, it's just, I, sometimes I tend to focus more about what's exactly on the page. And so I react to that, but uh, yeah, what the stuff that they're doing for me as a reader and the way I'm responding to it emotionally, uh, they get major, major credit for, for what they did and will continue to do as we get through this, this first storyline. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at my notes. One of the words I have here to describe the Legion at this point is confident, sometimes overconfident. Yes, yes. I think that, that speaks exactly to what you were saying earlier. <laughs> yeah, I even I also have in my note here, um, as much as I love Element Lad, uh, I don't, and if, if I if I just had to go by this, this these first two issues, Peter, uh, I would not think that he was a very good Legion leader. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, to be fair, there's a lot going on. You know, one of, one of the keywords I have in my notes is you know chaotic. There's a lot of you know this feels a lot of uh, like there's a lot of chaos going around. There's so much stuff uh, that we're reacting to. All these different scenes. You know, I in fact in my notes that's what I did. I, I wrote everything up by scene, and even though we go back to certain scenes, um, you know, I have I have twelve changes of perspective that go on here. Wow. in this book. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot, not, not to mention all the characters for both sides. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And and your your uh, your 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 third tier characters, science police characters, and whatnot. I mean, this is I, that's one of the things I love about the Legion, and I and I know that um, some people don't, and uh, I never I never really understood that because there's just so much to react to, so much for you to you know pick your favorites and follow follow along with them and and root for them. I don't know. This there, there's a lot of good stuff here, but like I said, Element Lad. I don't think I'd vote for him in the next Legion election <laughs> based on his performance here. You know, I think he gets the uh, unfortunate um, position of being leader during a time where Paul Levitz and company want to really explore what it means to be a leader. So I kind of liken this to every time there's a poll online and people are like, who are, who is the best Robin, Dick Grayson, Jason Todd, Tim Drake, or Damian Wayne? And a lot of people always say, well, of course, Tim Drake is the best Robin because he's the better detective or blah, 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 blah. And I always, I never answer those polls because I always say, of course, you're going to pick Tim Drake because he was written during a time when they were really paying attention to what it was to be Tim Drake as Robin, whereas mm-hmm. Dick, Dick Grayson was just Robin, and every writer wrote him differently, and he was a uh, a comedic character initially, and then he was a, a teen angsty character, and then he was a sidekick, a, a sidekick that was tired of living under. The, so they they did a they explored a lot of areas of Dick Grayson, but not with the writing mentality post Bronze Age, right? Mm-hmm. So. I feel like Element Lad kind of exists in that nature because his tenure, it's during a time when Paul Levitz and company are trying to open up all of their stories. Um, in fact, there's a, uh, I think the letter column in, is it this issue? Where they're still do, reprinting letter letters for previous Legion of Superheroes, superhero issues from like the 300s, where they're talking about you know, I don't really like this this uh, fast intercutting of scenes. Um, yes, I get that it means that we get more characters per book, but it means subplots stretch out longer and blah, 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 blah. So that feels like that's the era that Element Lad inherits. And um, I've always liked his tenure because, number one, it's when I was heavily reading The Legion, but number two... He was pulled in so many directions, personally and and professionally as a legionnaire. And um, I'm curious to see if we'll see more of that. Like that's one thing in my notes that I'm writing down under a a file that says um, things to keep watch issued by issue uh, is Element Lad's tenure as a as a leader. And now now you got me thinking, Peter. (laughs) That's what we're gonna do. We're just saying, just keep some ideas. Yeah, I feel bad for for what I said, but um... no, no, don't because I, I agree with you. He's he's not the best Legion leader, but I don't think it's always one hundred percent his fault. I think some of it is the dictates of boy, they really put him through the ringer. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, you, you know that just that just speaks for me. You know, just personally, that's just that speaks to me, or says to me that's how much I care about. Uh, these characters um, that I feel bad for criticizing this fictional <laughs> character in this comic book, because I really do like element lad. I, I always liked him too. Cause like you, he was, he was leader for mo- most, most of uh, uh, my early Legion reading. So mm-hmm. yeah, I have, I have a, a strong affection for, for element lad. I sort of steered uh, you into that, that, you know, after I was done. So <laughs> what did you think of the issue? Uh, but besides that, you know, I just, I, I really, uh, grasped, grasped onto this, this whole idea of the great passage that the Legion of Supervillains referenced a couple times. Yeah. And so, you know, just, just this, like I said, you know, like we said, we were not reading ahead. Uh, in my case, I think I said last, last time that, that I, I think I did read this storyline, but it was you know, a year later because I was reading it under the, the tales title. Mm-hmm. Um, but I haven't read it since it was first, that was first published. So, you know, that was 85 ish. Right. 
So I, I honestly don't remember a lot about what I read. And so that's got my, my interest peaked, this, this whole idea of this great passage. And then, you know, like I said, that, that opens up to, uh, to what they're up to. And again, like I said, the, <laughs> the, uh, the description that, that real simple description that we, we gave about the issue, you know, I, unfortunately, it re- to me, it revealed too much, perhaps. Hmm. And so now I'm really curious. So what is the great passage? What does it mean? Why are they doing this? And is it really what we were told it was? And and if, and if that's the case, what does that mean? And why are they doing it? Et cetera, et cetera. Right. Well, there is precedence or there is um, evidence or whatever you want to say. Um, so in the first scene where Lightning Lord is standing over his captured sister, Light Last, that, that captured her last issue. Um, he does say on the second page there, uh, let Esper Last place the psychic blocks in your mind, Aelia. Well, then the others will let you live and join us in ruling our universe. So when I read that initially, you know, that could be hyperbole, but um, then... There are some other places, like in the very next page, um, Lazon says, our portion of the plan requires us to secure these power spheres, but we're falling behind schedule. Um, we get the first mention of the Great Passage, Cosmic King, I think is the one that mentions it on page 13. The Great Passage is almost ready. We only need a few more tools. Uh, Nutrax says, you have the power spheres, the rest will follow, let us begin. Everybody, they're all, they're all kind of like antsy about it. Um, leading to what I thought was such a cool scene on page 16, where they're kidnapping, where they're stealing the polymer screen around the planet Earth. <laughs> I was like, how is that possible? First of all, how is it possible that they built the damn thing in the first place? But it is the <laughs> I mean, it is the future. But then we get another sort of notion here um, uh, when someone says uh, the warp is actually stealing the polymer shield. And then one of them says we cannot make the Great Passage without its protection. So it made me think Lightning Lord's little boast, join us in ruling our universe. Um, Sure, it probably he's sort of very pious and devout and pompous and and maniacal but um the great there's there's a tone to the use of the phrase great passage that i like that um it almost feels fanatical uh in a way and especially if you're going to have a team of supervillains that they all have different personalities they all have their different agendas um but Here's something that uni- is is unifying them, and it kind of makes me think. You know what? I think maybe they could take over the universe if uh, uh, if they get their act together. I guess. I guess what I you know what I re- was reacting to the whole idea of the Great Passage. You know what that what that connotes to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, they could do that. I, I'm sure they you know, or at least they think they could do it, <laughs> but. I don't know. I guess I, I get this. I was getting this sense because these characters, these villains are working in concert with each other in the way that they are with very little right now. Anyway, um, very little uh, squabbling among mm-hmm. themselves, mm-hmm. which you typically see with a group of villains. Like you say, they, they, uh, it's almost uh, perhaps a little fanatical on their part. Not, I'm not. I'm not quite getting that from everybody. Obviously, Lightning Lord, um, but he has his own issues, <laughs> personal <laughs> issues. Right. Uh, I don't know. I, I I got it. I don't know. I got even a more grand sense right now of them going after some sort of goal that's even beyond just taking over the UFP or you know you know quote unquote the universe. And so I, so I'm probably making a lot more out of this than I should based on what's here. But the, this whole idea of the villains working together like this, I mean, yeah, sure. Let's go kill our enemies. I mean, that's a typical plot point of any supervillain versus superhero story, but there's more to it than that. Right. And for some reason, I like to think that it's not just about conquering 
the world, so to speak, with mm. them. There's there's something else to it, and part of that is fueled by. And I, again, I I know I'm talking about Lightning Lord uh, again, but you know he talks about the the storm, mm-hmm. uh, telling him so. I don't remember where that is exactly, but but you know uh, something's going on here, at least from his perspective, that is greater than themselves, and I. I that's what really got me interested in this whole idea of this, whatever this great passage is. Yeah. Yeah. He said, uh, he says to Elia, join us. The storm said you would. And then yes. later, later he says, they're all going to die this time. The storm says so. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if the one sort of notion about the Legion of Supervillains um, in relation to the cliffhanger of this issue that kind of made me go, hmm, was this idea that there's somebody behind it all. And um, it sort of makes sense. You could you could kind of give some credence to the to the notion that well, the only person that could gather them together must be someone that is very knowledgeable about the Legion of Superheroes themselves, or is someone that is smarter than all the other Legion of Supervillains. So, like that scene with um, where Wildfire and Dawnstar are fighting a few of the Legion of Supervillains. Magno lad, he says, look, you know, there was a time when I would just hurl junk at you, but now I know what to do. And he destroys his containment suit. So when I got to that, I thought, yeah, you know, usually when these characters are written, especially in the 60s, 70s, they fight, but nobody's out to really hurt anybody. Even if they say, I'm going to kill you, you know, they, they, there's an elaborate plan that the hero can escape from 20 different ways, you know, um, but that little notion made me think – it made me think of of um, that DC storyline where all the villains prior to Infinite Crisis were, were organized and Calculator was in on it and, and that, that uh, Luthor character was in on it. And, and it made – so like I got to the ending and I thought it's not really supported that there's somebody behind all of them, but – but then if you go backwards and think, all right, well, then who did come up with a great passage plan? And and why are they organized? If they're so different, if they're so different personality-wise, if they're so different in how much they think this is going to succeed, somebody came up with this plan, and it doesn't feel like Lightning Lord is – or maybe, maybe, maybe that's what we're supposed to think, um, that Lightning Lord is the leader of it. Maybe what he's saying when he's saying the storm said you would, the storm says so. Maybe he's re- really referencing the man behind it all. So uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just sort of sub, you know speculating on that kind of stuff. But I get I get what you're saying. I I I, re- I get what you're saying. And and um, um, it wasn't until I read that last page and I I said, oh, that's how they introduced that there's somebody behind. I forgot that that's how they introduced the notion, the mystery that there's somebody behind them all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and to your point about, about lightning lad, um, lightning lad, lightning Lord, <laughs> uh, being the focal point of the group, you know, we get the, the, the first issue open with him. The second issue opens with him. He talks about the storm, like you said, and then there's that, there's that scene on page 13 where you get all the villains. And uh, you said, uh, what'd you say? The, calling card or something like that scorecard <laughs> scorecard yes and you know they literally on the page they have the names of the of the characters with these little arrows pointing to each one so you know exactly who is who um which i loved but you know it's 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 a weird bit of thing it, it would only have been better in my mind uh if they had little plaques with their na- names on them. <laughs> <laughs> like like when when superboy first encountered the legion right yeah, with the, with their names on their costumes. But I mean, um, how, but how great is that image, though? I mean, referencing uh, the Last Supper. Yes. Um, uh, you know, this is this little bit of art thing is totally out of the story, but it when I saw it, uh, I know as a kid I knew what it. Even as a kid, I think I knew what it was referencing. Even even if I I didn't exactly get the notion behind it. Um, it kind of speaks to that, excuse me, what we said about there's there's danger in what the storyline is trying to say, but the execution of it 
doesn't allow it to get um, dark. We're still going to yeah. have fun with the book. And this is clearly one of those moments that is like Keith Giffen saying, okay, I'm going to give, I'm going to give something a little fun here or whoever's, whoever idea it was, you know, I'm going to let the readers have a little fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and like I said, uh, Lightning Lord is to, to further that idea of him. He, he's sitting in, he's Jesus in this, in yeah. this, uh, this group shot, <laughs> which that's, that really is interesting to me. <laughs> You know, it, 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 is this just a, is this just a, essentially just a gag, um, by the artist or, you know, does this, does this mean something later? And then you, when you, if, if you look at uh, all the characters and their positions and who is who in relation to the last supper, uh, the Krypton or the Kryptonian, the Daxamite, Olvir is Judas mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. So does that does that come to pass? You know, does 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 Olvir become Judas in in some sense in this storyline? So, man, I, I Peter, I really hope this pays off because if it's just a if it's just a one off gag, a uh, visual gag, I'm going to be really disappointed. <laughs> well, now you know what you made me think though. Again, if this is metatextual, it's not. It, it it won't have anything to do with how this story plays out. But Olvir, look look what happens. He says, you know, we must do the bidding of the Dark Lord. And then he gets knocked out by Esper. So, you know, Judas was someone who was, uh, had his own plan or whatever. Um, and it, and then you, you go on with the scene and, uh, Esper last scoffs at him and says, why are we putting up with this lunatic? He thinks there's a real dark side, a god of evil. And I love that notion that even though we just went through the whole great darkness saga, that dark side is still almost considered like a legend, a myth in this era. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe putting him in Judas's spot makes sense because if you're saying, as this image clearly shows that lightning Lord is in Jesus's spot, well, he's not where we stop. There's someone who had a plan for Jesus. Right. So again, maybe that little bit of metatextual, um, writing or that little subtle thing is saying, well, if he's in the Jesus spot, there's still someone else behind the curtain. There's still someone else that is enacting the plan. Um, so, yes, it is totally a gag. <laughs> but, you know, if we want to get a little uh, highfalutin with it, I could, I could pull out some other things. <laughs> <laughs> and it just occurred to me as you were talking, Peter, considering what where Lightning Lord ends up down the road, there is a, <laughs> this is me really reaching right now. He goes through a transformational experience, a mm-hmm. rebirth, mm-hmm. just like his, the namesake in, in, in the last supper. <laughs> that, you know, and by the way, um, where Peter is, the where the apostle Peter is, is radiation Roy. So I, when I saw it, I was like, are you kidding me? My name's it, but I'm Radiation Roy. Okay, whatever. <laughs> the Radiator, Peter. He's the Radiator now. The radiator. The radi- That's a great. I like that scene where Tear is like, "You should change your name because it's stupid, and I don't deal with stupid people." Right. <laughs> and and his name is not much. His name for Radiation Roy is not much better. <laughs> radiator. <laughs> um. Let me see. Uh... I think if I had anything else about the, the Legion of Supervillains, because I mean, we we get to see them in action. We get to see most of them um, definitely by the end of the issue, um, and it's so cool that uh, the team, the writing team, the creative team, have pulled them from all different places. So some of them were versions of the Legion of Supervillains in the past. Some of them um, were members of a group from some of your earliest Legion comics, the League of Super Assassins. Um, some of them were Legion of Super Rejects. And um, some of them were brand new, like Terrace. This is his first appearance. And um, later on when we meet Zamir, the, the creature that's in the bubble, and he's the one that controls all the teleportation, we've seen that race before. 
in the Legion books, but we've never seen this particular character of Zamir. Mm-hmm. So he's new, and there's one other one that's, I think, uh, or no, that, I think the, that's it. Those those two are the first ones, or, or the two that are new um, for this series, and all the rest are, as I said, they've appeared before. Some of them only appeared like once, twice, three times, and that's it. So I like them. I like them as a group. I like what I like that we're going to live with them for a bunch more issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And since you, since you brought that up, um, I wanted to point out, uh, I thought this was interesting because for some reason, my mind, Peter, I thought that they had had a run in with the Legion of supervillains before this, but in that scene with where uh, they're on earth with, with the Legion of superheroes, they're all just kind of sitting around the table and, Element Lad is kind of briefing some of the rest of the Legionnaires about what's going on. They make reference to the previous time that they encountered the the, the villains. And that was back in Adventure Comics 371 and 372 from 1968. That threw me for a loop because, you know, maybe I was, I was just uh, conflating the, 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 the League of Super Assassins with with the legion of, of supervillains and you know the fatal five maybe i was just getting all those villains villain groups that the legion goes up against periodically kind of jumbled up in my brain thinking that they were legion of supervillain encounters of some kind but yeah 1968 that was a long time before this when i read that issue because i, I was doing some research on the on the characters and where they appeared the villains and so we get to this scene on earth um, it's page seven. Um, we get the scene in the headquarters where Ele- Element Lad is talking to basically the very few Legionnaires that are on, on Earth. Cosmic Boy, White Witch, Colossal Boy, um, Phantom Girl, and Block. And again, you know, again, to go back to that notion of, um, did I miss an issue or something like that? Like we had those very domesticated scenes with Colossal Boy in the first issue. And then in this issue, all we get is just one little panel. He's in costume. Boom, that's it. So it's like, well, what were those scenes about then? If we're, if we're not even going to deal with them again. But mm, yeah, but that's all seeds for later issues and stuff. Um, so, and by the way, I thought the artwork for this page feels the closest to what Keith Giffen it feels the closest to how he drew before he got onto his new style. Like it feels yeah. like that page could exist um, from around the early 300s or late 290s, you know? So anyway, so to your point, um, so they say last time we fought them, they were only trying to run a school for villains. Colossal voices. Don't remind me. You remember what an ass they made of me. And there is an issue of Superboy. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's Superboy and the Legion or just Superboy. It's a giant issue where they fight the Legion of Supervillains, and it's a team made up of Sun Emperor, although at that time he looks almost exactly like an evil Sun Boy. Radiation Roy is in that um, lineup. Um, Lightning Lord is in that lineup. And... Um, there's a, a one or two other ones. I can't remember who the other ones were. One I don't want to say until we get to the end of the issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they fight them, and they fight the Legion through their families. So they brainwash. Um, so Esper Last might be in it. She brainwashes. Um, they brainwash the Kents, uh, Colossal Boy's parents. And eventually they find a way to, to, to defeat him. But they're clearly called the Legion of Supervillains. And this was from around like 19, the mid-70s. So Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, it's exactly what I was thinking of. Um, so somebody got their uh, knowledge mixed up there, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Karen Berger, it's all her fault. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but she was pretty busy during this time. Well, you just mentioned the art, uh, Keith Giffen's art style. And... There were a few things in this issue that I responded to uh, just because it looks a little bit different than than the rest what's what's on the rest of the page or or the rest of the pages right mm-hmm. and uh, there there's uh, a couple scenes involving wildfire where 
he's just he's like basically wash in energy and i really like the way that that giffen uh, uh malstead and and uh what is what's his name gafford the colorist portrayed that you know it's it's barely it's barely a figure like i'm looking at page six um where wildfire is flying down and and just he's got all this energy crackling around him and he's firing firing that blast from his face mask you know it's just it's basically just a bunch of color with some blacks you know um uh, kirby crackle around him mm -hmm. and, and there, there's a couple of things like that and then there is there's this there's the scene on page 10 where titania uh kicks ultra boy away and and knocks him into um uh, monel and you get this Again, it's just really just splotches of color with these lines to help denote, you know, a, a leg or an arm or something like that. And that's the kind of stuff that I don't recall ever seeing in comics up to that point. And so I really enjoyed the 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 experimentation as much as it is from from the artistic team on this book. He does it. He did it there on the previous page too, where Lazon kind of goes right through Dawnstar. Oh, right, yeah. Um, yeah. And then later on in the book, where Lightning Lad and Sun Emperor are fighting, both of them are completely yeah. covered by their powers, and I, yeah. uh, I love every time he does that. Um, he does it in the second page with Lightning Lord because he's so mad at his sister, and he just explodes with power. and And I feel like it's, I feel like it's right. Like you're talking about 30th century characters, characters from the future, um, and maybe they only have one power. But when you only have one power, that power is going to be great. Mm -hmm. So I always feel like the Legion of Superheroes should be, and their villains, should be stronger than any of the characters from like the 20th century because, um, you know, evolution and all of that. Um <laughs> To show that artistically, some of it could be, some of it could just be shorthand, right? You know, I don't, why do I need to draw an exact figure when if I did it like this, it's a little more dynamic, it adds to the story, and it helps to show you how powerful they are. Like, right. I, I get that. I, I like that. Or like the crash, yeah. the crash scene at the, in the last two pages. There's a lot of panels in there that I'm like, I can't really tell what's going on there because the powers are working or there's an explosion or whatever. And, uh, uh, it's not a fault. You know, I don't, I don't think of it as a fault. I think it's like, that's cool. It, it kind of breaks up the page. It breaks up the eye. Um, and, and I said that this issue wasn't as dark as the first issue it opened up and all of that, but none of that was, I didn't mean any of that like negatively. I think, I think it's, it's still so good and it looks so good on the page, especially if you compare it to the reprint. Um, Dawnstar is like so beautiful throughout the whole issue. Her, her skin coloring is unique. It's not, it doesn't look the same as the other Caucasian characters. Um, um, the way they can do the effects on Sun Emperor. So he looks like he's always kind of like shining or radiating heat. Uh, mm hmm. And then they use a lot of zipatone um, for shadows, um, that old zipatone stuff that I don't think they even use anymore. So, no. yeah. yeah. And, and also the redesign of the Legion of Supervillains. Like, there's just very subtle redesigns if you look at their earlier appearances. Like, Lazon, he, is that his name? I keep saying Lazon. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. Um, he almost looks like he could be Light Ray from the New Gods or, or something. I mean, he's. Mm. It's it's his costume has they've tweaked it so that it's not so symmetrical and it's not so crisp and perfect. Um, and there's some other ones that they do that, too. Just subtle little tweaks here and there. Like Sun Emperor gets a whole total. He has a whole look from some of his earlier appearances. And um, I dig that. And again, it kind of pushes that whole futuristic angle for them. Well, and since you're talking about Sun Emperor, there, there's a particular scene that I want I definitely wanted to talk about. Um, and it's, you, you, you mentioned how it's, you know, uh, pushing the future or, or futuristic. And yet the scene that, that, um, that I want to talk about here is, uh, definitely just like the, uh, the, the, the painting, the last supper reference, you know, this is definitely in the past. Um, 
where he, this is what, page 14, where he is, uh, uh, assaults this poor servant girl and fries her to a crisp and then makes this horrible uh, reference to Hamlet. <laughs> uh, alas, poor Thora, I never did know her well as, as he's holding her, her uh, smoking skull. Ugh. But uh, at the same time, you know, uh, the, the, the panel there where he's actually, you know, burning her alive. I feel, and I feel really bad about talking so cavalierly about this character getting murdered like this, but, <laughs> but you know, it, the way it's presented, it's yeah, he murders this girl, but it's not, I still don't walk away from it feeling maybe this speaks to me as what kind of a human being I am, Peter, but <laughs> I don't, I don't come away from it feeling, you know, like this is a really dark issue, you know, like, right. like uh, you meant, you mentioned last episode, how uh, one of the, the, pre, the, the letter writers had complained about uh, this this uh, this series starting off being really dark, and you know I don't. But despite the villainous acts that's going on here, especially that one, I still don't get that sense. So, and I think part of that has to do with the way that it's presented. Um, it's, it's a bit of dark comedy, perhaps. Maybe not. You know, it's not a dark mood, but it's a dark comedy for sure. But then you have this the the little bit of fire that comes off of off of uh, uh, Sun Emperor and this this poor servant girl that extends up the page from from the very bottom of the page, you know, with with the with the sizzle uh, <laughs> uh, sound effect. You know, it's just it's it's like I said, it's a dark comedy at this point. But it, 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 I I really I always appreciate um, uh, Shakespearean references in comic books. Any theater reference. Yeah, I'm right there. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> what I what so maybe what also helps with that scene. So you you get a reaction from Radiation Roy and Terrace and Silver Slasher. Like they're they're put off by what just happens too. So clearly not everybody is a maniac like Sun Emperor. You know, not everybody's a sociopath. Mm. Um, and and I wanted to bring up this idea on the side of the Legion of Superheroes, but then I realized, oh, look, this really, it connects with this scene too. So in the first issue, um, the, the, one of the very first narrative boxes talks about this idea of vengeance and certainly the whole notion of what the Legion of Supervillains wants to do with the heroes. They all want to pick one of them and they all want to, they, there's a blood oath. They have to kill one member of the heroes. Some of it just because of whatever, some of it because of old, um, you know, feuds, obviously lightning Lord has personal, uh, feelings towards who he has to kill. And in that first issue, vengeance wasn't only coming from the villains. It was also coming from the heroes. If you think about shrinking violet, wanting to go after micro lad. Mm -hmm. And, and then in this issue, early on in the issue, um, she says she not only wants to go after micro lad on page eight, she wants to go after the creeps who saved him from us and look at Dawn, um, look at dream girl's face. She's kind of like a little shocked by what shrinking violet is saying. Um, maybe because of shrinking violet's new personality, but also because of, well, that's not a legion code thing. It's, we're, we're not a team for vengeance. Um, and also in issue one, the way that Monel feels it's his responsibility that that Olvir is this crazy Daxamite killing people, and and the way that he the way that he confronts Olvir, who is who is a kid even if he is a Daxamite, uh, was was as you made reference, it was sort of like he just jumped right on him. So. Compare that scene in this issue with the way Dream Girl is looking at Shrinking Violet and compare the scene that you just talked about, the way the Legion of Supervillains are looking at Sun Emperor and what he did. Um, is that Paul Levitt saying, you know, with this many cast of characters and this many personalities, um, look at the differences, but look at the similarities as well. Right. Right. I mean, we are we are talking about in some cases, literally two sides of the same coin. Yeah. With these characters. And, and since, since 
you brought that up. I wanted to just, I just wanted to to point out the, the, the cover to issue two with the villains, uh, you know, the way that they're, they're, they're staged there and they're, they're, you know, looking at us, some of some of them, they got their, their fist clenched, you know, whatnot. They got the flag. Um, if you, if you compare that to issue one, it's almost like, and, it, and the, the heroes there, some of them have the same sort of facial expressions and, and body expressions. And I thought, what, what if issue two is what the heroes are seeing as they come, as they tear through that wall mm. uh, to face the villains, you know? And so to me, it's, it's like the, the, the opposite sides of, of whatever this situation is. Right. And right. that also ties into this whole idea of them mirroring each other in certain fashions. Yeah. So I thought that was a really cool presentation. I don't know if that was intended that way or not, but uh, I, I really like that idea of exploring those aspects of, you know, hero versus villain and not a, a, as, as, as reflections of each other. You know, they do that a lot with Batman and Joker, for example. Right. Um, right. But I, I don't know that they did that a whole lot in the Legion and then, and certainly, Paul and, and Giffen and company are definitely playing with that in this particular storyline. And I really like that aspect. Yeah. And I mean, even the design of the cover, like uh, I, I like the first issue cover because it's very symmetrical, you know, it's got people in the foreground, people in the background. It's, it's, even though they're breaking through a wall, it's sort of circular, you know, and you got wildfire up top and a couple members down below. This one is like this. They're just, there i mean terrace is like shoved behind people and there's even figures that you don't look at tear you don't even see his face and there's two characters in shadows that who the hell they are i don't even know and um and i swear i've had this issue for how many years but this is the first time i realized that behind spider girl is probably zamir's bubble um Mm. and i don't think i ever really paid attention to that any uh, before so it's very cramped. Their faces are, are – some are hidden. Some are in – yeah, like that's a great point that you said. I, I didn't make reference of that until you said it. That's a – that's a, looking at those two covers side by side um, um, speaks speaks a lot about the this first story arc. So let's see. Um, I'll just run through a couple of notes. We can go back and forth. Um, so we were trying to speculate why they would capture Light Lass. Oh, yeah, good. And um, I thought it was because of insurance, like in case Lightning Lord went crazy um, and didn't kill Lightning Lad. But here we find out, no, it was his idea. Um, um, Why would I have had the others bring you here instead of killing you? And I guess, uh, well, number one, he wants to try to brainwash her and have her join the Legion of Supervillains. But I also wonder is... The other thing I wonder, because Mech it doesn't have a twin, is he trying to kill Lightning Lad so that Light Lass could be his twin? Mm-hmm. Is that the? I guess that's what we're supposed to come away with a little bit. Yeah, his his twisted version of that uh, of of sibling love. <laughs> that's a. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, no, but it's true. That's a, that's true. Let's see. I liked how this issue, this is, these are just like kind of quick fire thoughts, um, how all the teams kind of meet up. So we had Monel, Chameleon Boy, Shadow Lass, Ultra Boy, and Timberwolf on Daxum and then Tacron Galtos in issue one. But then on their way back or on their way to other members of the league, the Legion, they, they wind up, um, picking up Dawnstar and Wildfire. Um, I just like the the movement of the team was kind of interesting. Um, not only them, but then knowing that, again, Starboy, Dream Girl, and Shrinking Violet are on their way. Um, and they're all flying around in these cruisers. Man, that image of the cruiser where Chameleon Boy is, is coming down on like a tractor beam or something. That cru- Those cruisers are huge. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely bigger than what they used to be. In, in earlier uh, issues of the of the Legion, yeah. Especially if you think about, that one's only transporting five people. Do they really need a cruiser that big for five? <laughs> yeah, they, they, they seem to have gone from, uh, you know, because the, the old classic version of the Legion cruiser, it looked like it would hold like three people. <laughs> um, and, and yet now we have these big kind of blocky looking things. And that that's the other thing too is, 
the evolution of the architecture uh, of the Legion at this time has gotten a lot less uh, elaborate and in- intricate and more blocky and bigger mm-hmm. and more smooth uh, in some ways than, than what has happened in the past. And I never really liked that. I don't know about you, but I, I while I appreciated the, you know, the change because I always like to see things evolve in the comics I'm reading, especially ones that I read for years and years and years. Um, uh, that particular change was kind of like, wh- why, why are they doing it this way? What's, what's the, what are they going for? What's, what's the, uh, the raison d'etre that they're, that they're, they're after. Mm. Oh, I always love the, the, the Giffen architecture. The, the, when he, <laughs> when he went quirky, when he started going like, it's almost like watching Carmine Infantino in The Flash, where he would—he was basing a lot of his architecture off this crazy, like '50s, '60s stuff that was going on in South America. And um, oh, okay, uh, no, I dig it. it I, I, I like when it doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly helps to to promote the idea that this is the future. It's not. Right. It's not based on 1960s architecture or some sort of mishmash of. 60s and 80s or whatever you know it's it's giffen was i think he was really trying to 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 do something new with it even if i didn't really respond as well as 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 other people have to yeah. it yeah what were some of your what do you have for some notes so we had uh we had mentioned earlier about uh the perhaps the legion's blind spot when it comes to the villains or or just dealing with with that kind of a threat and i mean they they were very um um uh, direct with that here on page 20 with uh is it terrace mhm terrace yeah so or no i guess it's it's on 19 um, Terrace is in shadow. You know, you see, we see his shadow. He's about ready to attack uh, the Legion cruiser that you just talked about. Uh, Lightning Lord said they would never expect traps laid for them. Incredible, but true. And then he attacks them. And and uh, you know, that I just again, I thought that was that really drove that home. That the, that the Legion really, I don't know. Either they're just tactically not smart or or they're just perhaps they're just overwhelmed with with what's going on uh either way they're they're, it's not a good a good position for them to be in considering they know the threat they know that that these the the villains are gunning for them right because element lad he he sets up the entire issue with that the very first thing you see is hey everybody be be alert the the legion of super villains are out to get us and uh Mm, it, it doesn't quite work <laughs> his warning yeah so I, I i would hope well you know things are ramping up here uh, uh and i hope that the the heroes start reacting in a in a more um uh, well a smarter way i guess is <laughs> they should they should they should get together make a plan and, and you know execute but um but if if the villains keep throwing them off their heels as they are doing here, that speaks a lot to the, the the strategy that they have and how effective, unfortunately, it seems to be right now. Mm-hmm. And then that that actually leads into you know the very end of the book here. Um, but but before I jump to that, I wanted to just I wanted to ask you about this, Peter. Uh, so you know we we both love Interlac, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so. <laughs> There's this one page scene towards the end of the book where Imra, Saturn girl, is going to have a baby. And they do, well, there's a couple of things here. Uh, they have the doctor. I forget. What's the doctor's name? Do you remember, Peter? Dr. Gimmel or Jim. Gimmel, yes. Gimmel or Jimmel. Gimmel. Yeah. Yeah, I always pronounced it Gimmel. Yeah. Um, he, so, you know, he's, he's his usual bombastic, uh, 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 not angry, uh, annoyed, annoyed self. <laughs> but... Uh, he, he's like, you are here to have your baby, aren't you? He's talking to lightning lad and it's element lad who, who faints like some sort of 1950s sitcom dad, uh, about the news, uh, the sound effect that they have between these two panels is an interlock, <laughs> which I thought that's odd. <laughs> and I was looking through the issue to see if there was anything else like that. And I couldn't find anything. And 
So I'm, I'm really curious if that will show up again. And I don't, you know, there's, there's nothing really to it. I just thought what, what an odd choice, you know, for, for Giffen to do this, or, you know, maybe it was, uh, uh, Costanza, the letterer. Right. Well, who I mean, did, the, who put that in there? The book, the book, uh, I guess because we're, we're coming into this, uh, and not really talking about anything that came prior to it, but the book had its own humor and it had its own things that it would do. Um, like, for instance, um, Keith Giffen loved to draw Marvel characters or random DC characters in the back. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, you know, so you, <laughs> you'll get Thor, you'll get Spider-Man, you'll get um, the bellboy mascot, the gum mascot, the bellboy gum, whatever that was. Um, that was in a recent issue. Um, and, you know, if you're going to play around with Interlac, that's a that's a great way to do it. And and I love this page in general because just because of the humor, like it's sort of allowing itself to be humorous um, in a scene. Well, especially prior to an ending that is going to get serious. Exactly. A um, couple of things about that, by the way, real quick. So Dr. Gimmel, it didn't hit me until I read this issue. He looks and acts like Jack Klugman during the Quincy M.E. TV series. With- oh, yes. So if <laughs> if they – and he was he's sort of newish. You know, I don't know when he, his first appearance was, but it would have been after all of that. So if that's not an inspiration, I don't know because he really looks like him and, and acts like him. And then I thought um, the way they draw Lightning Lad in this – Ish on this page, um, it's very Mike Grell like, but it also he also looks like Jerry Reed from Smokey and the Bandit. Um, like that kind of made me laugh. Hmm. Okay. But the Jack Klugman thing hit me with this issue. I was like, oh my god, he's totally Jack Klugman, <laughs> totally Quincy. Uh, and I wonder how many people, younger people, who who uh, will listen to this and go, Quincy, what? <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about this ending. Yeah. What, what do you have to say about that? Well, you know, uh, we we talked. Uh, I think you you brought it up in the last episode when we were talking about issue one you know, about the castle that opened the 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 story then that that first issue, and we find out exactly where this castle is, um, which totally makes sense. You know, once it's revealed, it's like, oh well, duh. Mm-hmm. That it would make sense that it's here. Um. And then you you had you had talked about this earlier too. You know that it's not just the villains who are after the the, the legionnaires. It's it's this former legionnaire uh, who is also involved in this and who might be behind it, perhaps. Right. And so you get you get that that even that even deeper um, betrayal uh, to the legionnaires. Yeah. So happens on a rando and you got this other, this other guy who, um, it's nemesis kid, right? I was going to say, I mean, we should just say it, right? Like, you yeah. Just say who yeah. It is. Yeah. Did you know who it was? You, did you remember it from, is that something you remembered prior to reading? Well, I, you know, because I know what happens in issue five, right. right, right. Uh, you know, I, it, it makes sense. Uh, j- just given my knowledge of, of Legion history and that particular character. Yeah. Yeah. Plus he's, I mean, he's on the cover, right? That's, no. or is that a different, no, no, that's, that's not him. That's, um, that's Lazon, right? No, but he's the blonde, but he's on the reprint cover. Yeah. I was going to talk about that. Exactly. Exactly. Which, which I thought was like, well, that's weird. Why would you put him on the reprint cover? I mean, I know it's a right. year later, but if for those people who didn't read it, you know, you're, you're looking at Nemesis kid right there and then he's not in the issue, but then you get this cliffhanger where you don't really see him. Well, you kind of blew the spoiler there. Yeah. Yeah, oh, exactly. Oh, weird. Yeah. The other thing about him, the other thing that is an, a very obvious clue if you're a longtime Legion fan, um, Nemesis Kid's first appearance happened in an issue where uh, three other Legionnaires had their first appearance Pharaoh Lad, Princess Projectra, and Karate Kid. Oh, okay. I forgot about that. Yeah, and that Superboy issue that I referenced from the 70s that had a, a, a team of Legion of Superheroes, Nemesis Kid was in that team as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I remember that too. Yeah, so 
although I never really knew the mystery because I didn't know him at the time. Um, I wonder if that's why other, how other people might have figured it out. Like they might have gone, well, of course it's Nemesis Kid because he was a member before. He's on Orando, which is Queen Projectra's world, and and they all had their first appearance together. So it kind of makes sense. The clues are kind of there, I guess. If it's, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that subplot has been going on since Legion of Superheroes 305, which is uh, when Sun Emperor basically... Um, which is when the castle was like one of the first times it got t- taken over. So, um, so that little bit of subplot has been going on for a while. Ah, okay. See, I, I've forgotten so much about <laughs> all this stuff that I've read. Now I, now I want to go back and read those earlier three, you know, 300 issues, uh, to, to kind of get the background of some of the subplot stuff. Right. But yeah, I mean, what a way, what a way to, to, you know, you, you, you got a little bit of humor going on throughout this thing. Yes, the the uh, uh, the the drama is is ramping up. Uh, the the danger is ramping up, and then you got that quick scene, that quick sitcomish scene uh, to contrast that end to really pique your interest and go, oh, what's going to happen next? Yeah, <laughs> very well plotted, very very well paced. Yeah. Um, some, like we've talked about some, some great artistic choices, uh, such a, I'm really glad you wanted to, to start talking about uh, the Legion using this, this storyline, Peter, this is, this is, this has been a lot of fun. Good. Good. Well, let's do this. Um, I can burn through some quick little things for like another couple minutes and then we'll, we'll do all the back end stuff of this, uh, episode. How's that sound? Okay. Okay. Medicus one where Dr. Gimmel has his thing, his uh, office. I don't think it's ever really been confirmed, but it is absolutely the futuristic version of the JLA satellite. Yeah. Look at it. I mean, it's got the the, the, the circle in the center, the outer um, portion, the, the, the four little hallways that connect it, or the four, four little, you know... Um, um, if you look at it structurally, I mean, it, it, it has to be in my, in my head canon, it is the justice league satellite. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I totally get that. Yeah. Um, I, oh. I also like that issue because I mean that page because it's cosmic boy light, it's the founders talking, even though, right. even though element lad is the leader. I love that the founders get a scene like that and, and cosmic boy is the one that's updating the other two. That just, that's such a great scene. You know, uh, speaking of that scene though, I always found it curious, you know, we, we talked before about how the, the legionnaires have been calling each other by their names more in this, in this Baxter run. Mm -hmm. And yet you have the, the three founding members whom you would think would have the most intimate relationships <laughs> among all the legionnaires, and yet Cosmic Boy refers to both of them by their code names. Yeah, and and you know it's it's not like they're in the field or they're dealing you know doing legion business. Imra and and uh, Garth are having a baby, you know, and and I you know I don't know I don't know what they do with it in terms of of. You know, like a Godfather situation, but I, you know, my head, Cosmic Boy, Cosmic Boy is the 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 logical choice to be their child's Godfather. So, mm. and yet, you know, you know, Cosmic Boy is 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 very much uh, uh, prof- very professional <laughs> in this scene. So, um, page nineteen, um, talking about panel design. I love that's that's the one where you were talking about Terrace uh, laying a trap. So if you follow the way that they're flying. Panel one, they're sort of flying downwards and then towards the middle panel when they're flying upwards, and that's how you read it, and then you go downwards again. So oh, yes. I really like that. Uh, Very good, yeah. The panel layout is pretty cool. Um, page 16, we get one little tiny little appearance of one of my favorite Legionnaire characters ever. Gigi Quisimano is there, <laughs> although she's getting beat up on. I love me some Gigi, so it, it was great to see her, even though we only saw her for a little bit. Yeah, and and it's, it's, it's to me it was curious, you know, we get that scene a couple of pages earlier with with Sun Emperor and that that poor servant girl. He could have just as easily have done that to Gigi. 
Mm. But then that would have really changed the tone of the book. Yeah. Of, of this particular issue. So I, I can see why from a storytelling standpoint that they wouldn't want to do that. Right. Um, just a couple more things. Page nine. When after Wildfire's suit has exploded, um, Dawnstar reacts to it. But if you sort of think about her and Lazon have been chasing each other, is she seeing Wildfire or is she mentally seeing? Because, you know, there's a, this whole thing between them. They just came off this soul quest that she was having um, to find her soul mate, and it was interrupted by Wildfire, obviously. Um, but I like that the image of him exploding is sort of drawn right on her face, almost to suggest it's mental as opposed to her seeing it in front of her. So I don't know if that's what they're going for, but I kind of well, like that notion. Yeah, and I was going to ask you about that, what you thought about that, because it to me, I, I, to me, it was kind of a maybe a, a bit of an art experiment that didn't quite go right. But because I mean, it, to me, it looks like a reflection, like 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 as as if she had um, a face mask, you know, some sort of uh, protective suit. And then I remembered, wait a minute, the Legionnaires do have that. When when they're out in space, they do have that invisible spacesuit thing, mm, right, that, right? That they that they rarely reference. And I thought, well, maybe maybe Giffen's playing with that idea. But I like your I like your uh, your uh, idea better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I forget what they call it. The flight, the is it a flight suit? I don't know. We'll we'll probably come across it at some point. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess that, that's sort of it for me. What other what other tidbits did you have? Let's see here. Because uh, you you've you've actually touched on a few of those uh, already. Um, I just I thought you know I, I respond a lot to to characterization, and so. That scene, that quick scene with uh, with uh, uh, Starboy and Dream Girl mm -hmm. and um, um, uh, Shrinking Violet, <laughs> Tom is becoming a bit of a, a bit of a caricature, caricature of himself, you know, because he, he, you know, all this stuff's going on. They 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 do have Shrinking Violet there, and you know what we know what she has gone through, and yet all he can think about is alone time with his girl. And I, I realize that's that's kind of one of their things that has defined that relationship over the years, <laughs> you know, their, their steadfast, um, um, uh, connection with each other, mm -hmm. but you know, it just, it just seems out of place and, and tone deaf in some ways to me that he would be talking about this stuff and, and dream girl who, who usually in, in the past has been depicted more ditzy perhaps mm -hmm. is, I mean, she's going through a transformation herself uh, uh, in previous issues leading up to this. She's not that character anymore. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a lot more subtle with what happened with you know, her transformation as a character, as opposed right. to say shrinking Violet, who has a definite catalyst right. that uh, has transformed her. So uh, in my mind, Tom is definitely lessened as a character that I, that I like because of his, his, kind of one mindedness, uh, one track mindedness and dream girl is certainly moving up there in, in, in cachet to me in terms of her character. Cool. And, uh, let's see here. Uh, you mentioned Gigi. Oh, uh, speaking of that. <laughs> so, you know, that old joke about, uh, how the enterprise on star Trek is, is the only ship, uh, that's in, in range of whatever the threat is. Mm -hmm. I thought, so here's Earth. They're stealing the polymer shield, and, and we only see one science police vessel? <laughs> Where's the rest of the science police? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> They're spread thin. I think that's it. I do have, I do have one more thing that, from the letter column, but um, if we want to move on, we can. Um, let me see if I, I think that's it. I think that's pretty much it for the... The book. I mean, I have I have like little trivia things, but um, what what do you have for the letter column? Well, it it it, uh, it announced the the next Legion election mm -hmm. in, in the back of of, the, of issue two, and so I was gonna I was just curious if you had ever voted in a Legion election. 
I, I think I did. I, I couldn't tell you who I voted for, but you know, you got to remember 1984. I was June of 1984, I think is when this issue came out. So I was, uh, 11. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't quite remember, but I know I think I'm I, sure I did. Yeah, I think I, I think I did, but only when they did it. And it was one, I think one of the last times they did it, but they did it online. Right, right. One of the first forays into doing something like that. So I, I always thought that was a cool idea, though, that the, the, the readers could affect what the, what the creators could do with, with these characters based on who would be the leader. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the readership definitely threw uh, the book for a loop a few times over the years uh, because of that. Yeah. Speaking of the readers, um, it's sort of interesting, the little feedback that um, if you read, uh, and I know you did, the, the what people thought of these issues. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some people thinking that Lightlass is the one that's going to die. Some people guessing who was behind it all. Um, but there's there's there was some real debate about this notion of reprinting the stories a year later or or not having two books. Um, some people saying, you know, forget about the people who are going to wait a year, like just make it all about the Baxter issue. And then there's other people like. Why are you giving up the reprints? Why, why, if Superman and Batman can have multiple titles, why can't the Legion have multiple titles? So, mm -hmm. um, and some people even, some of this feedback comes from the Baxter run, but some of it comes from people reacting to when it was finally printed in the Tales book. And they said, you know, they would say things like, um, having the two books run concurrently, the two storylines running concurrently was actually maybe not a good idea because by the time they read the reprints, they already knew what was going on because of mm -hmm. people talking or whatever. So unlike the new Teen Titans, which the Baxter run takes place a year after the stories that were being told at the same time, the Legion was running at the same time in each book. So, Right. Um, yeah, this. I was really surprised at how big the debate was. Well, and and one of the one of the letter writers uh, talked about not coddling the cheap, ignorant malcontents. I mean, that is that is almost <laughs> a a quote. He called uh, out Eric. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was wow. Pre pre internet days. Uh, um, the the. The trolls were, were alive and well back then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that was, you know, and good on, on the, the creative team because they said, look, you know, we cannot give up the newsstand. There's 30 to 40,000 outlets. The, if you think the diehard comic people are just buying from the direct market, that's not true. And, you know, it kind of speaks a lot about the comic industry. And, and I know it's not the comic industry's fault that the newsstands finally said, look, your books cost too much and there's little profit here. It's not like a magazine that has a lot of information and can cost, you know, five, six bucks and we get a lot of profit out of it. Comics don't get a lot of profit. So they kicked comics out of newsstands. It wasn't like the, it wasn't like the publishers wanted that to, to leave. So thirty, mm -hmm. forty thousand outlets. That's amazing. So, so it's good that they they had um, letters that were against, and they, and that way they were able to explain their position. Well, and I always I always enjoyed reading the. I don't do it so much anymore. Of course, a lot of, not a lot of comics have letter columns, but they have made a comeback, uh, in various titles. But uh, I always enjoyed reading the letter columns back then. You know, back in the 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 eighties. Uh, when I was reading comics and, and I always enjoyed seeing the differing opinions. I always thought it was really cool that the, the company or, or, you know, editors or whoever, whoever dealt with the, the letter columns would, would, pre would uh, pre uh, prevent, present um, uh, differing viewpoints. And it was, it was always kind of neat to see that and, and to kind of have a weird uh, conversation going on because there were, you know, people would write letters and people would respond to the people writing the letters. And, and so, you know, it was, it was a really interesting mix of ideas and, uh, back and forth that, the, that the, the readership had in those letter columns. So it, yeah, it's, it was kind of nice to, 
to look at those again as as we're as we're going through these issues. Yeah. Well, you have anything else about the issue? No, I think I think we've uh, talked about it pretty pretty well. Yeah, that was great. I mean, there, I mean, we I'm sure we could talk about a lot more stuff if we just kept going. I know. I know. <laughs> At some point, we gotta. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> put a hold on it. But no, I think that was good. That was a bigger conversation than I thought we were going to have. And I think it speaks to the execution of the book. Yes. I did mention real quick, I have a couple trivia things as we sort of wrap up here. Um, so Titania, who has been around for, oh, I don't know, 20 years, uh, since the 60s or 70s as a character, maybe, maybe the 70s, I'm not sure. Um, just prior to this issue, was the release of Secret Wars number three or four, um, which they created their own Titania on the Secret Mm -hmm. Wars planet. They both are redheads, they both are powerful, and they both have purple suits. So if you think about Jim Shooter being, you know, having his hands in all of that, it makes you wonder if um, he was using that as a whole. Oh. Um, And there's a lot of Marvel sort of crossover. Um, The League of Super Assassins, that are made up of um, New Tracks, Block, Mistmaster, Lazon, Titania, Silver Slasher. They were actually supposed to be X-Men analogs. So Block, Block was created to be sort of like a Colossus character. New Tracks was Professor X and Cyclops. Mistmaster was Storm. Lazon was Sunfire. Titania was Thunderbird. And Silver Slasher was uh, Wolverine. And at the same time over in the X-Men universe... They were creating the Imperial Guard, which are very clearly Legion analogs. I thought that was a little bit of fun little trivia for this uh, for this issue. Hmm. I will have to uh, uh, see if I can come up with some stuff too next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had no idea. I it's so obvious now when you mention it. The with the the League of Super Assassins, I never made that connection. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I, I I read that I read I read that one issue nearly forty years ago, and <laughs> you know I haven't read it since. So right, I don't <laughs> think it's as I don't think it's as strong a analog or comparison like the Imperial Guard are. You know, mm, yeah, I think they went out of their way to kind of change it up a little bit. The only thing- and did 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 uh, sorry did Dave Cockrum have. Did he help create the Imperial Guard, or was that an, a different artist? Oh yeah, I think I, I think it was Dave Cockrum. Yeah, yeah well, he, that that totally makes sense then. Yeah, he brought over some ideas, some some leftover Legion ideas. He brought them over. Yeah. Think about this. Help me figure this out, maybe for next issue, or maybe the the listeners can. I'm trying to figure out where the title comes from. So the first issue title was "Here a Villain, There a Villain," I think, and then this one is "Where a Villain," and I'm trying to think. Is this a is this a take on the old McDonald nursery rhyme? That's what I took it as. Okay, and I guess that kind of makes sense too if you think about the nature of um, that nursery rhyme keeps getting bigger and bigger, and so does the this so does the plan, so does the cast of characters, um, so will the artwork. Um, yeah, I was trying to figure that out, and and, and I wasn't quite sure. Um, so. So that's good that you're you're backing me up there. So we'll say yes. Yeah. So do do you know do you know it? Does it go beyond that? The, the just that that preamble part of it. Uh, you're a villain. They're a villain. We're a villain. I don't know. I mean, issue is issue three going to be everywhere a villain villain? Maybe. Should we, <laughs> should we cheat and look it up? No, no. Let's let's come back to that. Okay, we'll come back to it. <laughs> Things have meaning. I like when titles have meanings. So yeah, yeah. Or, or, you know, connections at least to right. something else. Yeah. Okay. Are we done? I think we're done. Woo. That was a workout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Quite honestly, Peter, I did. I, I wasn't sure how long we would actually talk about this issue because it, you know, it, it, it's, it's more of a, a plot moving forward type of thing right. uh, in terms of the storytelling. And so I thought, well, maybe. Well, we won't have much to say about it, but obviously. Obviously we did. That's, yeah. That's good. I, That's good. Yeah. 
I do want to do maybe something at the end of maybe not every episode, but um, I want to give a shout out to uh, something on the net that's Legion related. Um, the Legion of Super Bloggers dot blogspot dot com. Uh, they are a collection of bloggers and they talk about obviously the Legion of Superheroes. And and when you go to the website, we'll put the link in the show notes. Um, all along the right hand side, if you click the Baxter image, it goes to all of the posts that have to do with the Baxter run. If you hit, um, I don't know, you know, reboot, it goes to all of the reboot blogs that were posted and they jump around like one day it'll be uh, a review of, you know, an old adventure comics issue um, or it'll be a review of one of the cartoon episodes. So it's a whole collection um, um, that, uh, you know, I just like to go look at it and just see if people have like interesting things to say about issues or just what, what are they talking about at this point? Um, so I just wanted to give them a shout out. And wasn't that Peter, wasn't that the one that, uh, that they had a write up of the first issue that you sent me or is that a different website? Oh, I forgot. I, I forgot that I even sent you. It could be. Yeah. Like, I think that's, I'm using it sort of like, uh, after I read it and write all my notes, like it's kind of fun to see if they have like links to anything else or, you know, it's a good backup sort of thing. Like, um, mm -hmm. you know, if, if I ever come up with a crazy notion, did somebody else come up with the notion to, and, um, I was like, okay, good. I'm not, I'm not crazy. I, I did. <laughs> it does make sense. So yeah, it's a good reference place. So, um, I wanted people to know that it's out there so that other people can use it as well. All right. Shall we wrap it up and get out of here? Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll release this baby and we'll come back to, uh, episode three. So please, by all means, send us your comments, uh, Peter at the daily Rios and Eric. Uh, you can send uh, email to longboxreview at gmail dot com. We don't really have any kind of like uh, wrap up <laughs> catchphrase, right? No, we don't. <laughs> the outro is just us going. Uh, yeah, I guess that's yeah. it. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Long live the Legion. That's perfect. Long live the Legion. <laughs> we'll see you next time. All right, bye guys. Bye.